Hi everybody. It's time for Psionics, second edition. Episode 14 of the Psionics series. Okay. Let's get this more stuff learned about Psionics. Okay. Now, D&D &D likes to try to balance out playability of characters and and races so that no one race or character class can just dominate all the time that you know there's some kind of balancing going on short and long term so that's why it has a lot of things it has in it that a lot of people today don't understand it's they're trying to make it fun for everybody and challenging for everybody and not make it so like one class does everything and is super powerful. Uh, that was where they were coming from. Now, I understand, you know, as a kid, I, I just never questioned this stuff. I'm like, okay, that's the rules. Let's do it. As an adult, I can look back and go, hmm, I can see where people are coming from on this on this or that or questioning things i mean i get it i get the questions and i can see why different games developed as a result you know people just like i don't like that so i'm going to change it and then pretty soon they got a whole new game so i i i, I understand but for 2e there's restrictions okay rules is the rules as written all right so, weapons. Psionics tend to disdain weapons of any sort, given the crudeness and imprecision of such tools compared to psychic weaponry. So this is about specialization, about being the elite. Still, a good sidearm arm is indispensable for a last-ditch personal defense. And it's essential when a display of psionic power would be inappropriate. Also, in the rough and tumble frontier areas where adventurers are common, appearing in public without a weapon often invites ridicule and trouble. So we're getting an idea here of how the uh, untamed uh, areas are, are thought of, how society thinks. Psionicists can use any of their common weapons listed below. Essentially, these are most small or medium-sized weapons weighing six pounds or less. So if you added anything to the list, this helps you figure out what to add, okay? So we got a short bow, a hand crossbow, the light crossbow, dagger, dirk, knife, club, hand axe, throwing axe, horseman's mace, horseman's pick, Scimitar, spear, short sword, war hammer. Depends on the war hammer, I think, a little bit, but okay. Cause I, I got a war hammer. It's actually a Viking war hammer. <laughs> yeah, it's Icelandic. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I don't never weighed it, but I think it's more than six pounds. At any rate, this gives you this gives you an idea. Like a tomahawk, maybe is what they mean by a war hammer type thing. Uh, something more along those lines, like a, or maybe one of the, uh, the ball kind of war hammers. Um, I have a, I have a war, war axe. That's what I have. It's not a hammer, but it seems like the hammer would be way even more than my axe. So I don't know, you know. Now I do I do believe everybody has the right to uh, defend themselves and bludgeon something that's trying to kill them. I just I, I do believe that everybody should get to use a club in an emergency <laughs> of some sort, <laughs> even if it's a chair leg. <laughs> armor. Psionicists can don armor made of padded leather, studded leather, or hide. They can also carry a small shield. A psionicist can use his powers while wearing a helmet that is psionically active or one featuring magical enhancements that affect or simulate 
psionic powers. But if the psionicist is wearing a normal helmet of any sort, he cannot use his powers. Removing a normal helmet won't affect the character's armor class, but it may have other effects defined by the dungeon master. For example, a thief who approaches the psionicist from behind may find the psionicist easy prey, or if the DM allows called shots, the character's bare head might present a tempting target. Optional rule. A DM may allow psionicists to wear any sort of armor, but impose penalties. For heavy armor that's made of metal, this rule creates a, an across-the-board reduction of psionic power scores when a psionic wears inappropriate armor. And then it gives us... Um, Armor penalties, so padded, leather, studded, leather hide, zero reduction. Brigandine, ring, scale, splint mail, negative one reduction. Chain, banded mail, negative two. Plate mail, negative three. Field plate, negative five. Full plate, negative seven. So that's something to think about and it's not outside of what I would call New Age psychic lore. Um, I'm a little bit aware of that lore. So uh, some of the stranger books I've got in my book collection I inherited. Um, you know, uh, there's a whole thing about like what kind of materials you should wear. Like it should be cotton, cloth you know, clothing only, no animal products. I mean... You know, or it could only be all natural, you know, products or, you know, there, there's actually, there's actually what I would call lore involving um, use of psionic abilities in real life. So it doesn't surprise me to see it in D&D. &D. This is something to think about. They didn't necessarily just pull some of these ideas out of nowhere, like randomly. Like, you can go get books and read what people thought about how, like, ESP and all that stuff works in real life. Whether you think ESP exists or not, irrelevant, it has a lore. So, which eventually, I, I do want to get into, like, looking at some actual lore of that stuff to see if it'll help give you... Um, anything that can inspire you but right now mechanics so our next section is proficiency psychic powers function like proficiencies but they do not replace them sinuses can learn the usual weapon and non-weapon proficiencies regardless of their powers proficiencies are acquired at a rate shown on table 10. it's right down here psionics S can learn a weapon proficiency for any weapon they can use. They can learn any non-weapon proficiency from the general group. See proficiency rules in AD&D, 2nd edition player's handbook, page 54, page th uh, table 37. Uh, or from Psionis' group described below. If the optional prof proficiency rules in the player's handbook are in use, Psionis' can gain extra non-weaponry profi proficiency slots based on their intelligence score. See Table 4, Intelligence in the Player's Handbook to determine these bonus proficiencies. Chapter 5, page 16. Characters can use these extra slots for languages or non-weapon proficiencies, but never additional psychic powers. Initial refers to the number of weapons or non-weaponary proficiency slots received by a sound assist at first level. Number of levels indicates how many levels a sound assist may advance before he receives a new weapon or non-weapon proficiency. The sound assist receive a new weapon proficiency every five levels at level 5, 10, 15, 20, etc. They receive a new non-weapon proficiency every three levels at levels 3, 6, 9, 12, etc. Penalty is the modifier to a psionic's attack rolls when he fights using a weapon he isn't proficient with. This penalty is subtracted directly from the character's rolls to hit. 
The Sionix Group Table 11 lists seven non-weapon proficiencies which uh, psionicists can easily learn. These proficiencies, the psionics group, are an extension of Table 37 in the Advanced D&D 2nd Edition Player's Handbook. All right, so we'll, okay. So um, we'll take a look at a, at a few things. Psionics, non-weapon proficiencies. Jim Cuddy takes two slots. Uh, relevant ability, dexterity, subtract two. Harness, subconscious, two slots. Wisdom, subtract one. Hypnosis, one slot. Charisma, select two. Rejuvenation, one slot. Wisdom, subtract one. Meditative focus, one slot. Wisdom, plus one. Musical instrument, one slot. Dexterity, subtract one. Reading, writing, one slot. Intelligence, plus one. Religion, one slot wisdom plus zero. And then the persistency, the psionics proficiency slots, the group psionicist initial weapons proficiency is two. Um, it gives levels number five. And then it gives penalty negative three and non weapon, I mean negative four, sorry. And then non-weapon proficiencies, initial three, levels number three. So, you know, I, I explained that a little bit with just, just now, just before I did the, you know, how it goes up. 5, 10, 15, 20, that, that thing. And 3, 6, 9, 12. And that's what they're talking about there. We got this cool page. See, yeah, look at all that. Look at that black art goodness. And then we have the, this little section here, chart. There you go. Yeah, I got to see what I'm doing. All right. Now, the next section is harness subconscious, and it's pretty long. And then we have wild talents after that. So, okay, so I see what they're saying. So they're going to go into the powers or the proficiencies. So harness subconscious, hypnosis, explain it, rejuvenation, meditative focus, gym cutting, musical instrument, reading, writing, religion. They tell you to just find that in the player's handbook for descriptions of these proficiencies. So I think what I'll do is, is, is the next episode. I know this is going slow, guys. Um, Take a look at harness subconscious, what that is, what hypnosis is, because these are like multi paragraph, and what rejuvenation and meditative focus is, and then hopefully get to start wild talents. And then we'll get into um, how you figure that out because they have like a whole thing on determining powers, strength points, risks. charts for that and then you get into we finally get to chapter two which is uh sonic combat so that's what's coming up as we as we work through this all right i'm trying to take it slow because 2e has a lot of stuff and i also think uh, when we get to the powers the actual sonic abilities as they're described in the book, like so. Um, what I really want to do is look and see how different the descriptions are from Eldritch Wizardry to um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Because there's, you know, there's one E, because there's only like, I think, 50 powers that you're dealing with there. And then the equivalent in 2E for the ones that are the same, right? And see how they change. So we're aware of the mechanical differences, if they if there's if there's any, or flavor differences, or however you want to look at it. And then um, take a look, start taking a look at what are the what are the powers in 2E when we get to that point. 
you know, that they've added, because they added like, you know, there's a hundred more new things to do. And it's the same way over in that Rolaids book. They've got like a ridiculous amount of stuff too. Yeah, this book has also, just so you know, it has a whole thing on, there's some psychic monsters, you know, psionic monsters. There's a psionic campaign. And they've got it in different um, uh, TSR campaign worlds. They talk about it. Like Forgotten Realms, World of Greyhawk, Dragonlance, Ravenloft, Spelljammer. And then, of course, we all know Dark Sun came out, and that was like a whole new level of, yes, psionics, you know. So, um, I know psionics can be played well because of Dark Sun. I know that. So, uh, don't, don't fear your psionics. And like I said, you can always introduce stuff in baby steps. I said that at the beginning when we started the series, and I'm trying to remind you guys. You know, you get a book like this, and it's a lot of info, and it can be seem overwhelming. But, you know, when you get the player's handbook or the DM's guide, it's got all the spells and stuff in there. That could be overwhelming, too, until you realize, oh, yeah, they only get to pick from here. Or this doesn't start working until they get to this level. And then it just depends, too, on how you do it. Um, if an ability or spell is rumored, a part of lore, to have existed once. At least like a magical item or, or even an item that doesn't have to be magical, just symbolic. Um, but no one's ever seen it seen anybody do it they've only read about it heard about it but nobody knows how to right or where this thing is or those kind of situations that means you can use that thing as a hook for an adventure you have to go find the dude on the mountain to teach you the super secret thing right got a you know the ancient city of tuba tool had mages that knew the, the the spell of levitation you know they knew how to levitate stuff let's say magically but nobody's spell books in the setting that you're playing has that spell yet right even even people above the the player's character on the you can do that and then it creates an adventure you got to go find the dude on the mountain. You got to go. You got to go on this adventure to track down um, an ancient device that makes your mind more powerful, or or um, an ancient spell that's supposed to be written on the wall of some tomb or something. That, or the ancient library of Xander. Let's say, let's say there's a place called Xander and they had an ancient library that, you know, the city got covered and everybody died in a, in a, some kind of sandstorm and the place is cursed. They're supposed to be out there in the desert. This is how you do it. And in that library is a secret to the learning and self-teaching yourself, the psionic ability of le le levitation or spellbook or something or whatever it is, the players need to go f get their characters hiney to and find. That's your hook. That's your, Mc I think they call it the McGovern, you know. So think about those things. You can introduce stuff slowly. And then you know how it's going to play out in your games. And you don't feel like you've um, done something that uh, you can't um, undo. All right? So, everybody, have a great day. Um, don't fear the mechanics. Don't fear the psionics. Don't fear the combat. Don't fear any of it. It's, it's all there to help you adjudicate. And keep the story's line having tension and fun and challenge. It's all there to help. Okay? All right. Bye, everybody.